Hi, I'm Nathan Lusk with Warrior with a Pen Games, and today we're going to talk about uh, Yama Yama Tani Tani. It's a complicated name. <clears throat> I'm sure most of you don't know what that means, so I'm going to tell you really quick. It is a saying from uh, legendary Japanese daimyo Oda Nobunaga. Um, he said at one point when he was fighting the uh, warrior monks, the Iko Iki set in Japan, he uh, he said, uh, I will hunt them down on every hill and valley. And that phrase, on every hill and valley, is yama yama tani tani. So um, <clears throat> this, this is a very expansive game with 14 battlefields, 120 different characters, uh, divided into 12 armies with 10 uh, generals in each. Um, each of those armies consists of one warlord, either Chinese or Japanese, plus his nine uh, closest generals. And you take control of any of them to battle your opponent on the battlefield. You can play with two or four players. Technically, you could play with more. Um, but even the four-player variant's a little odd, um, and I'll explain how all that works. Um, what you see here before you is battlefield number one for a Chinese battle. So you and your opponent must both either be Chinese or Japanese warlords, um, and then that determines the battlefields that you fight on. And the reason for that discrepancy, that you must both be the same, is because there's a huge amount of technology difference between the Chinese uh, warlords who are from the uh, second, third century AD, and the Japanese warlords who are from the 16th century AD. So the Japanese had rifles and the Chinese did not. And um, so there's a, a bit of a difference in the way they work, and it's a little bit more fair if either both armies have an opportunity to have rifles or no armies have an opportunity to have rifles. So the setup that I have for you right now would be the first battle of two Chinese um, kingdoms going against each other. We have the armies of Dong Zhuo, who was the evil despot who began the civil war in China at the in the late Han um, that set up the Three Kingdoms era of China. Um, he deposed the emperor and tried to take his place by putting a puppet emperor on the throne. Um, anyway, he's going to be against Liu Bei who was the hero of the novels, uh, The Three Kingdoms, Romance of the Three Kingdoms. And um, each of them has brought four good generals with him. And it's going to give us just an opportunity to kind of go over the tactics and the strategy of the game. Um, mind you, there are, like I said, six Chinese warlords and six Japanese warlords to choose from. And they are uh, unique. Each one is diverse. Um, some of them are a little bit more difficult to use than others. Dong Zhuo's army is a little bit more difficult than, for instance, Liu Bei's army, because Dong Zhuo's army is very um, striated from top to bottom. There's, there's really good guys at the top, a few really good generals that he has, and then very sparse um, generals in the middle, and then a bunch of lower-end generals that are on his team. Uh, Liu Bei tends to be a little heavier at the top. He does not have anyone quite as good as Liu Bu, who was considered the greatest warrior that ever lived. He's one of Dong Zhuo's generals. Um, Liu Bu is the, easily the best general in this entire game for Chinese or Japanese on any side. But after Liu Bu, you know, it gets a little sparse. He's also got Zheng Liao, who's, who's really, really good. But, I mean, it gets really sparse after that. Liu Bei's pretty consistently good throughout. He's got a couple of weak ones, uh, weaker ones. But they all um, have their own place. And it's just a little bit more harmonious to use him. So, um, let's go over the cards real quick. Let me show you uh, what each character's card looks like. There's a large card and a small card for each character. And as you can see, they are... Uh, pretty much the same, just the size difference. The small one will go on the board on this one of these little stands as a standee. And the large one goes on the side so that you can keep track of your generals and how many men they have. Um, what I do right now is I use poker chips to keep track of the soldiers that are on each one. That number is the one 
near the bottom of the card where it says 2,000. Zhao Yun comes with 2,000 men. Um, that number could be as high as 5,000, depending on who you choose. Dong Zhuo, in fact, does come with 5,000 men. So uh, the other information on the card is his attack ability, which is a 9 on Zhao Yun in particular. These are scaled on a uh, scale of 1 to 10, so 9 is very strong. Defense is scaled from 1 to 5, so he's as good as you can get defensively. And then speed is a 1 for him also. Speed is al uh, always either a 1 or a 2, so there's not much of a difference between the top and the bottom. Then there's IQ, which is the brown one. That's an 8 for Zhao Yun. And then order. Order determines what order your generals go in during a combat. So... Every army has generals ranked from 1 to 10. Since there are 10 generals, they're ranked in order from 1 to 10. So naturally, your order number 1, if he's present in a battle, will go first, and then order number 2, and then order number 3, so on and so forth. But since you only ever bring 5 of your 10 generals to a battle, um, you'll never have you know, 1 through 10, uh, with a possible exception we can talk about in a minute. Um, also on Zhao Yun's card, you'll see that it tells you what um, troops he's allowed to use. He can use any infantry or any cavalry units, and there's a variety of those as well. He comes with the skill Raid, um, and we'll go over skills here in just a moment too. And then, of course, the only other information on the card is his name. So before the battle begins, both, both uh, players have to go through and determine what kind of units each of their generals will be leading. So since Zhao Yun is allowed to lead either uh, any infantry unit he wants or any cavalry unit that he wants, I've chosen to give him medium cavalry, which comes with its own skill as well. Every unit adds a second skill to a general. So medium cavalry gives him the ability to slash on top of the raid skill that he already has. And it goes just like this when you put it down so that you can quickly add up the totals. Uh, choosing a troop type does not add number of men, doesn't add a number of troops to your general. It only adds uh, attack, defense, movement, and a new skill. So um, all of those, that's the only things that they add. And so that's what you're considering whenever you tru choose troop types for your generals. Um, if you want to see a few of the other examples, Guan Yu, who already has raid also, uh, he has a the ability to take any cavalry type units and so i chose to give him um well wow, that's that's not what i chose for him <laughs> I totally have the wrong thing under him i wasn't paying attention i think that was supposed to probably go somewhere else so we're going to give him heavy cavalry there we go heavy cavalry the two heavy infantry and cavalry units halberdiers and heavy cavalry have the same attack and defense but the cavalry of course um, in the infantry, but they have different skills. So um, he now has his heavy cavalry like he is supposed to. I've got to put these back the way they were. There we go. There. So Guan Yu is a really good general also. You notice he's the same base stats as Zhao Yun. Nine attack, five defense. And then we added plus three, plus three, plus one to him. Uh, and then he starts with the skill raid, but he also picked up the skill crash, so he's ready to go. Um, everyone, no, not everyone has different units because there's only certain units available. <coughs> but each of the different unit types um, provide their own advantages and disadvantages. Just, it, typically, the weaker attack and defense a unit gives, the less of attack and defense that a unit gives to its general, the more speed it gives it. So he's more maneuverable and he can get around the battlefield better and use his tactics a little bit more strategically, um, he just won't quite hit as hard. So, we have talked about the generals, we've talked about the units, and the units available, by the way, there's three infantry, infantry, spearmen, and halberdiers. There's three cavalry units, light cavalry, medium cavalry, heavy cavalry. There are four different archer types, that is archers, heavy archers, crossbowmen, and mounted archers. And then of course, if you have uh, Japanese generals, there are also the riflemen. Um, and they're the only type of rifle that there is, is rifles. 
but that one small difference of adding those riflemen does make a difference in the way the armies work. Um, so, uh, as battle number one, Dong Zhuo gets to go first, according to the Order of Lords, which is um, just tells you what order the different kingdoms are allowed to go in the first battle. And of course, for battle number two, it switches. And so if we were on battle number two instead of battle number one, Liu Bei would go first, but I digress. So um, his first high, or his highest order character is Liu Bu, who has an order of one. So he's the first character to move for both armies. So if Liu Bei also had an order number one on the table, which he doesn't, um, Dong Zhuo's number one would go first, then Liu Bei's number one would go because Dong Zhuo gets to go first. So um, order number one, Liu Bu, has a total of three movement. So he's going to go one, two, three. And now we check Liu Bei's army. He doesn't have a number one. He only has a number two order. And Dong Zhuo also has a number two order. So since he gets to go first, his number two gets to go as well. He has a movement of three, one, two, three. And now Liu Bei's first order number two gets to take his turn, that's Zhao Yun. He has a speed of four. See, these two are only allowed to move two spaces. Zhao Yun is allowed to move four. And he's actually gonna stop because he, he doesn't want these two to be able to reach him on their next turn. So strategically, Zhao Yun's only gonna use three of his speed and then he's gonna wait and let the rest of his army catch up, hopefully. So at this point, we look at the next order. So Dong Zhuo's other three generals are order seven, eight, and nine, while Liu Bei's are three, four, five, and eight. So Liu Bei's three, four, and five now get to go. And then it will be Dong Zhuo seven and eight, and then Liu Bei's eight, and then Dong Zhuo's nine. So pretty easy to keep track of. So now we'll move Zhang Fei, he's in order three. He has four movement, and he'll go to there. And now we get to move Zhuge Liang, who has three movement, and he is an archer, so we want to keep him behind our stronger guys. And now Liu Bei is allowed to move. He has four movement. And I think, we, yeah, that'll work. He'll go there. And now we go back to Dong Zhuo. He has seven movement, or I'm sorry, seven order, and he has four movement with himself. One two, three, four. And now Hua Xiong's turn. He's order number eight for Dong Zhuo. He only has three movement. And now Jia Xu only has two. And actually Jia Xu doesn't get to go yet. It's Guan Yu's turn because he's at order number eight over here. He'll move two. And now Jia Xu moves two. So everyone has moved. I'm gonna pull these back now. And now everyone's taking their first turn. So you can tell in the next turn, based on the movements, the way everyone just moved there, that there's about to be some combat happening uh, one way or another. And that's good because I wanted to, that's the next thing we need to talk about. So let's continue the turn uh, the way we did that one. And we will, yeah, we'll get into some of these skills and you'll get to see what some of these skills do. So these two guys take their first moves and now it is, Zhao Yun's turn to take his move. So <coughs> Zhao Yun has two skills, right? He has Slash, excuse me, he has Slash and he has Raid. Slash is a skill that means that he can attack all opponents adjacent to him when he attacks. So if he were to move here and then use his Slash, I'm gonna turn him sideways so I know I used him, he would hit both Zheng Liao and Lu Bu. Um, and it's basically his attack skill versus their defense skill, and that's how many troops they lose. Conversely, instead, Zhao Yun could choose to use his raid, which does the same thing technically, but not in the same way. A raid means that you start on one end, you start with one general, and you attack that general and consider that you have moved into his space while you're attacking him then you're, whoop, you're allowed to attack any adjacent uh, opponents who are in the same general direction um, that you began the movement going toward. So since his attack began going this way, um, you would the general direction will be the one behind that plus the two adjacent to it. So as he attacks Zheng Liao, he could then move to any of these three 
as his next attack. And since Lu Bu's in one of them, I could raid and hit Lu Bu. And then as, as you attack the very last general, uh, and you can attack however many opponents are in a line, as long as it's no more than once each, and you're still moving in a same general direction. But once you finish with the last one, you then exit that raid. Whoops. <laughs> you then exit that raid in the same general direction in which you were moving as you hit the last one. So if I move here, and then I attack Zheng Liao, then I attack Lu Bu, and then I exit on one of these three. It, that's how the, the move uh, works. So that's what we're gonna do instead of the uh, slash is to raid. So Zhao Yun moves here. He first attacks Zheng Liao. Zhao Yun's attack is a nine, plus his unit, his medium cavalry, gives him a bonus of two, so his attack's an 11. And Zheng Liao's total defense is a five plus three, so eight. So Zhao Yun's 11 minus Zheng Liao's eight means that Zheng Liao just lost three soldiers, uh, which is actually 300 out of his 4,000. Um, so basically you have 40 chips on top of Zheng Liao and you would lose three of them now. So then Zhao Yun hits Lu Bu, who has the exact same defense. So he also loses three three men, and then Zheng Liao finishes his move right here on the other side of Lu Bu. Now here's why it's important that I'm turning him to realize that I used him. <clears throat> because one of the hallmarks of this game, one of the key points to this game and the chief strategies for victory is not to just step up and hit a general when it's your turn. It is to orchestrate your army in a way that when one of your generals uses a skill, it triggers your other generals to use their skills as well. And that's what I've just done now with Zhao Yun. He, uh, by hitting these two, has what I use in the, in the rules, it's called activated any of my other generals who are in range to hit the, uh, any generals that have already been hit. So Zhuge Liang is here in my background and he has archers, he has heavy archers, which have a skill called volley, which means that they can shoot um, into a group of opponent soldiers that are close together. The rules have it specifically drawn out how a volley works. It's right here. You'll see the word on the left, volley. And then there are two different patterns which it can fire there and there. These two are definitely within those patterns. So now Zhuge Liang fires his volley and he has an attack of eight plus a, uh, an attack bonus of two for having heavy archers, which makes it 10. But he also gets a bonus as the second general in a combo. He gets a plus one bonus to his attack because his attack now is hitting someone who's already been hit by someone else. They're, they're um, weakened and so now he is... As, as the second hit of the combo, he gets a bonus to his attack. So Zhao Yun counts as an 11 also instead of a 10. And so he hits Zheng Liao for another three because it's his 11 attack minus Zheng Liao's total of eight defense. And he hits Lu Bu for another three. That's the 11 attack minus his eight defense. <coughs> so in one move, Zhao Yun's turn, Zheng Liao and Lu Bu both have lost six chips which is 600 troops apiece, which is a total of 1,200 troops just in one attack. Now, Zhuge Liang um, is not, uh, it doesn't take his turn to do that. It's just a bonus turn he gets to do any time he's triggered. And because of his skill, volley is so wide ranging, it's one that's really easy to activate. Um, fortunately, he is gonna have a turn here pretty soon and um, but Zheng Fei is about to activate him again. So now it's Zheng Fei's turn. He has four movement. One, two, three. One, two, three, four. I want to move in a way where I'm not, where I'm keeping these generals together. Yeah, here we go. One, two, three. Zheng Fei's going to move here and then he's going to charge into Zheng Liao. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Charge is a skill that when you're adjacent to an opponent, you hit them and you move them as you hit them and you take their previous spot. 
So now, if you notice what's about to happen, Zheng Fei is going to charge into Zheng Liao, and as he hits him, he's going to do his own damage. But that, in turn, is going to trigger Zhao Yun to use his raid again to go through both of them, because this guy is in range of Zhao Yun's raid. You see how this works? And so Zheng Fei is going to hit Zheng Liao. Zhao Yun is going to hit Lu Bu and Zheng Liao. Then Zhuge Liang is going to volley again, because that's, that's how volley works. He got triggered when those two got hit. Now it's a three-hit combo. And here's the scary part. The next person to act is going to be Zhuge Liang again, who will volley the two. <laughs> Zhao Yun will raid... Well, he'll be here by then. Zhao Yun will, will raid the two, and then Zheng Fei will choose one of them to charge into again. And this will just... And in fact, if he does it to there... Does, does Liu Bei have an offensive skill? He does. He also has charge. And then Liu Bei would charge... And see how it's constantly building and building and building into a much larger combo. Much more is happening um, as my uh, men continue to surround them. And, I, and I'm now hitting them for exponentially more troops. I'm going to weed these two generals out much, much faster. And Liu Bei is going to be well on his way to victory here. Now, that doesn't mean Dong Zhuo can't turn it around. Especially with Liu Bu and Zhang Liao out front. Those two are his heavy hitters. Um, and he's got his own archer sitting in the back just waiting a turn, so um, it's by no means over. But you see how the skills uh, work themselves together to provide much more monumental effect against your opponents. So, that was an example of the way the game plays. It was an example of how skills work. And I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on that because I don't want to make my videos too long. And... That is something I'm really good at, is making videos too long. So, let me pack these up, the characters and, and all of that. And then let's talk about the rest of the game. Uh, if you choose Chinese warriors... Hold on, let's go back. If we're going to talk about this, one of the things we need to talk about is how you can play with more than just two, two players in this game. So one way to do that is for two of you to be Chinese and two of you to be Japanese. And the Chinese, the two Chinese players, um, they choose from the six Chinese warlords that are available. And those are um, Liu Biao, who is uh, the purple army over here, which, um, you know, that's, that's probably more than, yeah, lots of people. They're the purple one in that stack. <laughs> uh, Liu Biao. Yuan Shao, Dong Zhuo, Liu Bei, uh, Sun Jian, and Cao Cao, or Cao Cao, depending on uh, what translation you're using. <coughs> Those are the six Chinese war, uh, warlords that are available. And then of the Japanese daimyo that are available, there are uh, Hojo um, Ujiesu, there is Mori Motonari, um, Miyoshi. Yoshitsugu, the uh, armies of um, Uesugi Kenshin, Takeda Shingen, and of course Oda Nobunaga, um, who is, he's obviously has to be one of the choices in a game like this. Um, and all of the uh, Japanese have a touch more troops than the Chinese too. Not by much, but there is a difference in the number of troops they have. Plus they all get the rifle ability. So, you and your opponent would each choose a Japanese or a Chinese um, warlord. Of course, you have to be the same. So if you want to play with four players, two of you would take Chinese, two of you would take Japanese, and then the two of you on Chinese uh, warriors, warlords, would, would fight on Chinese battlefields, which is what we have here. This one that we just did this example on is the first battle of the Chinese wars, and it is Hulao Gate in the year 190. Now, once this battle is fought, here is that battlefield, by the way. And these are not necessarily final, but I hope you like these. I made these on incarnate.com. It's a great place to build maps and battlefields and everything else you might want to build. So, <clears throat> Hulao Gate in the year 190, followed very shortly for the second battle of 
Luo Yang in the year 190. Battle number two for China. This is a very difficult battlefield because of the bridges. It changed the strategy up significantly. And then we have Guan Du in the year 200. This was an important battlefield between Yuan Shao and Cao Cao. Jiang Xia, another one with some bridges on it. In the year 208. And then we have the battle for Jing in 209. Zhen Xia was a, a battle in Jing, but this was the overall battle for control of Jing that occurred just, just a year later. And then the next to last battle. So this is battle number six of China. It's, it's Hanzhong in the year 215. And it's very different. It's in a, a valley where it's, everything's a little bit more constricted than the other battlefields in general. Um, and this is usually going to be the last battle between two Chinese warlords. And the reason that it's usually going to be it instead of it definitely is it is because whenever someone wins a battle, the person that wins is the one who had at least one general left on the battlefield, of course. <clears throat> however many generals that winner had left on the battlefield, you know, how many were still alive, um, that is the number of mandate that that warlord gets. So if you have three generals left on the battlefield, when you win it, you get three mandate. Uh, after six battles, if one side has more mandate than the other, then that person is crowned as the winner already. They've won either the Chinese or the Japanese um, unification, and it's game over. However, if both players are tied after six turns, after six battles, in the number of mandate points, say it's six to six or, you know, nine to nine or whatever, if they have the same amount of mandate, then after you finish, here's Hanzhong, by the way, after you finish the sixth battle, you then move on to a seventh battle, which is fought between all 10 of your generals against each other. This is Mount Dingjun in the year 219. So this is the ultimate final battle between two Chinese uh, warlords, and there, there must be a winner. So that one determines who is the winner if they are tied after six battles. We also have seven Japanese battlefields. So your other two players, if you're playing a four-player game, um, the two that chose to be Japanese would instead be fighting on this on these battlefields. This is the first one, Okehazama, uh, in the year 1560. This is where Nobunaga destroyed the armies of Imagawa Yoshimoto. And you can see the thunderstorm rolling in, the lightning here and here. Then there's Kawanakajima, one of the great battles between Usugi and Takeda, right here in Kawanakajima. We have Mikatagahara in 1573. The Battle of Nagashino in 1575. The Battle of Tadorigawa, 1577. Then you go on to the Battle of Odawara, 1590. This is the sixth battle for Japanese warlords. But if there is a tie after this sixth battle, you go to the seventh, which is famous Sekigahara, year 1600. And this is where the final reckoning would be if they're tied. So if you're playing with four players instead of just two, once your Japanese champion has been crowned and your Chinese champion has been crowned, um, pick one battlefield of either the Japanese or the Chinese with either five or ten um, spots for your generals and have one final battle between them to determine who the overall champion is between Japan and China. I will say it'll be slightly weighted toward the Japanese. Um, they have slightly more troops, but the right combination of skills and, um, you know, movement points, just, just the, right, the right ability to play the game can help a Chinese player to actually win that too. Um, it really comes down to the, the players. If you haven't noticed yet, there are zero dice in this game. The only luck that there is to be felt in this game 
is the determinations of your opponent because you never can quite, you know, assume that you know what your opponent is going to do. So uh, you're really hoping that you get lucky and he makes a mistake. And that's a, a really great, uh, it'll be a good bonus, you know, for you. When you're, every time your opponent makes a mistake in this game, it is important. It's a big deal. And it ends up uh, playing out very heavily. Uh, mistakes do cost quite a bit in this pure strategy game. Uh, once again, this game is called Yama Yama. Tani Tani. We are um, uh, needing artwork. Of course, the maps are mostly done. The battlefields are mostly done. Again, I may make some changes to them as well. But for the most part, they're finished. We're just looking for uh, getting some artwork for all of the little character cards, for the box, for the rule book, for the rest of it, to get some stuff put together for the game and make sure that the beauty in its presentation matches the the beauty of the the way the skills play off of each other and the variety of options you have with generals and the um the pure strategy that's involved in the game is really beautiful it's a it's a neat game with um, pure tactical decisions that drive it and uh, when you take luck out of the picture which i don't always do in games but in this one it fits really really well um you really get really deeply involved in what exactly makes a, sh uh, a winning strategy. So um, I hope you appreciate this game. I hope you like it. And we'd love to uh, get this one finished, get some artwork put on it, and uh, get this one out there available for people to take a look at and see if it's something that they want to play themselves. So um, I'm Nathan Lusk with Warrior with a Pin Games, and I appreciate you watching the video. Have a great day.